Well, thank you, and thank you, um, everyone, for inviting me here to to Norway. Um, <clears throat> I, I was going to say start with something different, but um, now that we're here in Ebsen's Playhouse, I was reminded this morning that when I was 12 years old, I needed something to read for school, and my mother gave me a copy of The Doll's House, Ibsen. And she gave me the book, and she said, here, read this, it will make you a feminist. <laughs> and I went to school, and um, the librarian, who I still remember very well, took me aside and took me into the stacks of the library and told me that I couldn't read this book, uh, that it was too old for me, that I shouldn't be reading it, and I cried, I was very upset. And I went home and my mother said, well, don't worry about her, just read it at home. Um, little did I know then that I would be standing here um, in this playhouse. But um, the book worked, I think. Uh, my mother was right. It, it made me a feminist. So, <laughs> but let's talk about um, what I'd call the worldview of the unending war on terror. And that's where we are today. So much has changed after 9-11, and it really didn't change just the United States. It changed the entire world. And everywhere is viewed through a single lens now, and that lens is the lens of terrorism. And it's terrorism and national security. And they go hand in hand, unfortunately. So we live in a world that is afraid of terrorism and calls everything terrorism. And we live in a world where national security is what decides everything that we're going to do. According to my government, at least, the entire world is a battlefield. So it doesn't matter where somebody is, it's a battlefield, which means that someone can be prosecuted for war crimes anywhere in the world. That is a number one big change um, and a very dramatic and, and frightening change that has happened since 9-11. We've also seen throughout the world the militarization of the police. We've seen it in the United States. We've seen it in other countries. You can't tell whether they're policemen or soldiers anymore because they all look the same. Uh, and they all look like soldiers and they act like soldiers. We've used fear against anyone considered other everywhere in the world. And, for example, in the U.S., people go to jail now for a long time, a very long time, for what we call material support to terrorism, which means just about whatever the court wants it to mean or whatever the prosecution wants it to mean. It can mean giving funds to an organization that's been designated as a terrorist organization even when the terrorist organization happens to be in the government, for example, like Hamas or Hezbollah. It includes providing charity. I have a client, Abu, um, Shukri Abu Bakr, who's serving 65 years in a federal penitentiary for providing charity to children in Palestine. That's what he was charged with, and that's what he was convicted of. He was never charged with any violent act. But um, there's another reason that that case is concerning that is something we're talking about here today, which is secrecy. Because for the first time in U.S. history, in that case, we had an expert and we could, who we could know nothing about. He was an Israeli. He said he was a Shin Bet uh, expert, but as far as we knew, he could have been anyone. And in fact, at the trial, when he was cross-examined, my co-counsel cross-examined him and said, well, you could be a Mossad agent pretending to be a Shin Bet lawyer. And he said, that's right, you cannot research me. But he was able to say that our clients had assisted Hamas and there was nothing we could do about it. We've also seen in the U.S. and in other places that people who have attempted to tell the public about crimes committed by the government have themselves had to commit a crime. So let's think about that. When you have to commit a crime to report a crime, of course that's what whistleblowers do. That's basically the definition of whistleblowing. Um, in the 
national security and public area. So Chelsea Manning, Edward Snowden, and a host of others have been convicted, or in Ed's case, fear conviction, for the crime of whistleblowing, which in the United States now is called espionage. But their crime was exposing a truth, not spying. Whistleblowing should never be confused with espionage. Espionage, by definition, public Publish, um, excuse me, punishes spying or giving aid to the enemy or harming your own country. But that's not what Chelsea did. Chelsea is my client, or what Ed did, or the others. They told us secrets that we had a right to know because it's secrets about our government. And when the government does something that's illegal or immoral or embarrassing, then the public has a right to know about it. But that's, in fact, why we need whistleblowers. But the problem is that, of course, whistleblowing is a crime, and therefore you have to commit the crime to expose the crime. I want us to think about the fact that secrets and surveillance go together. They always go together. They're the flip side of a coin. When you have secrets, you have surveillance. When you have surveillance, you have secrets. And the other problem is, and I'm going to talk about surveillance a little bit, but secrets never come out on their own. That's because they're secret. And they're things that the government wants to keep secret. So you first have to have someone who has the knowledge, someone who knows the secret and will do whatever is necessary to get it out in the public. But you also have to have a forum. You have to have journalists or bloggers or someone who's willing to tell the public about the secret. And what you really need and what we don't have is a legal system that will protect that person. So what happens when the government hears the truth it tried to hide and the legal system fails to protect that person? That's what happened to Chelsea Manning. Chelsea is doing 35 years in a um, military prison for exposing to the public that the United States was committing war crimes, that there were abuses that we had a right to know about, that we should know what our government was doing. But we didn't know. We didn't know any of it. And Chelsea bears the brunt of that. Edward Snowden told us the truth about a secret court in the U.S. called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court that was secretly authorizing the National Security Agency, known to most people as NSA, to collect millions of phone records of innocent people all over the country, everywhere, all our phone records. We didn't know that. We had a right to know that the government was acting in a way that we believed was illegal. Mohamedou Salahi, who Rodna mentioned, told us the truth about Guantanamo, and it took six years for me to get his book published. And then it came out with 2,500 redactions. Makes for quick reading, because you can skip all the pages that are blacked out. <laughs> <laughs> I want to add a note of, um, this is always such a somber talk when I give it, but Mohamedou is now free. I was in Africa with him just five days ago. Uh, he was just released two weeks ago from Guantanamo after 15 years uh, when he was there. And I'll, I'll talk about him again a little bit more. Um, but it's, it's nice to have some good news. Now, the other thing that I feel like I always need to say is I do believe that all governments have legitimate secrets. There, I don't believe that everything should be out in the public. Um, it's the nature of governments. We don't have a one-world government. That's not where we are today. Maybe it would, be, it would be nice if that's where we were, but we're not. And so there are legitimate secrets, but that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about are the illegitimate secrets, the secrets that prevent us from having a free society, secrets that make us afraid, Secrets that keep us from participating in our own democracies. Because fundamentally, if the government has this many secrets, 
then we've lost freedom of expression and we've lost the right to free speech. We are a host of international treaties um, that I'm sure require this government and mine to protect freedom of expression. But unfortunately, that's not where we are today. So let me go back to Chelsea a little bit. What was Chelsea's motive? Her motive was to expose wrongdoing. But her motive didn't matter. Because under the law in the United States, the Espionage Act, the way the courts interpret it, it doesn't matter why she exposed the secrets. It just matters that she did expose secrets. And we have to remember that this was an act passed in World War I. It was a bad act at a bad time. But it was because the United States was afraid of spies. And if it had been limited to spies, it might not be such a terrible act. But there have been, I believe, eight or nine people now <coughs> prosecuted in the United States just under the Obama administration for espionage, for the act of whistleblowing. So we're not talking about spies anymore. We're talking about people who tell us what we have the right to know. And if Chelsea's case stands, uh, at this point, her case is on appeal. Uh, I represent her in the criminal court for the Army, and we've written a 250-page brief. We're waiting for the government's brief. Um, we're also going to be filing a petition for clemency very shortly for Chelsea. But if, if we fail, and if she doesn't get out, and even if she does get out after having served already six or seven years, um, everyone runs the risk in the United States of prosecution for whistleblowing. And that includes journalists. And journalists, when journalists are afraid also, then we have no way to get information out. Because without a free press, how do we get any secret out? Needless to say, um, the journalists are afraid. Look at uh, Julian Assange, who's a ju journalist, who's afraid and is locked up in the Ecuadorian embassy um, for now, I think, four years because he's afraid that the U.S. has an indictment against him, an indictment that, by the way, is secret. So everywhere we turn, there's secrecy. Everywhere we go, we're, we hit the wall of secrecy. Let's consider Mohamedou al-Salahi. Mohamedou wrote a book in 2005 while he was in solitary confinement in Guantanamo. I met him in 2005 um, and began to represent him at that time. And I asked him to write down what had happened to him because he had been tortured for the year and a half before that. And he began writing for me what became 466 pages in English, his fourth language. And it took from 2005 till 2012 to get it away from the government and get it out. And then it was published. The name of the book is Guantanamo Diary. It's available in Norwegian, English, and 25 other languages. And I really do hope you'll read it because he, um, he recounts an odyssey that began when he turned himself in for questioning in his native Mauritania, where he is now. And he was questioned there in November 2001, then sent secretly, secretly again, to Jordan, which at that time was a secret black site, is now public. He then went on another secret rendition to Afghanistan, and finally to Guantanamo. All of this in secret. So. Without his book, we wouldn't know how he felt about what was done to him. We wouldn't know the true actual facts of his torture, which came out in large part in a government report in 2008, and that's why ultimately they couldn't suppress his book anymore. But now he can speak. And what's important to remember is that he was in a secret place. Everything he said was considered classified, which meant it was secret. Every letter he wrote to me until we got the government to finally release it. And he was never charged with any crime, ever, in the 15 years. Finally, thankfully, he is home. But 
he also maintains dignity and humor. And, and I have to say this um, for Mohamedou's sake. At the end of the book, he says in, a, in an afterword that he wrote in 2014 that he hopes that he can sit down with all the people he talks about and have a cup of tea together because, as he says, we have learned so much from each other. And in his first interview after his release, he said he forgives everyone who has wronged him. So if you want to find out what happened to him, you'll have to read the book. So let's talk about another secret. The black sites. Um, horrible torture was inflicted on several other people who are now in Guantanamo, including my other client there, Abrahim El Nasri, who currently faces the death penalty in a military commission in the United States. His torture was inflicted in countries I can't even mention. Um, we didn't know these places existed or anything about them until a journalist found out that they existed, and then they were all sent to Guantanamo. But then, to make things worse, he was waterboarded, and that part is public, but there were videotapes of that waterboarding, and those were destroyed. Um, so again, in an effort to keep them secret. So let me ask you a question. Could the UN have even considered opening a, a prison in Guantanamo if it was public? Of course not. It had to be secret. What about the black sites where other countries cooperated with the United States in torturing clients? Could that have been done in the public? Of course not. It had to be secret. What about the NSA surveillance program? The Americans would have been up in arms and foreign governments who found out that NSA was, was secretly uh, monitoring them. None of that could have happened if the government said, oh, by the way, we're going to be listening uh, <clears throat> and, and to all of your calls to find out who you're calling. So the public wouldn't tolerate this if it were public. A few years ago, President Obama made this statement. My administration is committed to creating an unprecedented level of openness in government. Openness will strengthen our democracy, promote efficiency and effectiveness in government. Transparency promotes accountability, provides information for citizens about what their government is doing. Well, I couldn't agree more. However, that's not what's happening. And after what happened to Chelsea and Jeff Sterling and Kiriakou and the other U.S. whistleblowers, what's happening to Snowden and Assange, this is a real fear. There's a real fear that if you expose, if any of us expose secrets that we know, that we believe the government should not be keeping, that we'll go to jail. So I want to talk briefly about surveillance because surveillance goes hand in hand with secrecy. Governments spy on us secretly, and surveillance just means spying. That's all it means. Surveillance is, a, is just a big word that means to spy. It is fundamentally always used by the powerful against the powerless. It is a technology of disciplining and managing populations. That's how surveillance is used. It destroys dissent. Surveillance, it's the flip side of the lack of privacy. Without privacy, no one can feel safe to dissent. Without dissent, we no longer have a free society. Democracy dies, and the rule of law dies with it. We live in a moment now, in my government for sure, and I suspect in others, that we have warrantless wiretapping. We have these drones flying around. We have monitors of private emails and Facebook. We have people infiltrating mosques. We have in infiltrators of activist groups. We have large-scale U.S. surveillance that harms journalists, harms the law, and will destroy any freedom and democracy that we have. So one of the arguments on the other side is, well, they're just collecting metadata. What is metadata? Metadata is who you call, when you call, 
where you're calling, who's calling you. Maybe not the phone calls themselves, the actual conversations. So we just learned, and I just learned this a week or so ago, that AT&T, which is one of the largest telephone and data collectors in the world, has a secret program and has had that program for years. It's called Hemisphere. It searches trillions of call records and analyzes cellular data of everyone. It can determine where the caller is located, who the caller is speaking to. So that's not the government gathering this information. The government says, not us. It's AT&T. And they developed it for the government. And they store the details of every call, every text message, every Skype call, everything that goes across them. And they save it for years, years and years. So what they have are patterns. I mean, you know, maybe you call your mother three times a day. Maybe your mother calls you three times a day. What business is it of the government's or of AT&T? But if AT&T keeps this, and I'm sure the other others do too, it's just that we've only just found out about AT&T, and then they give it to the government, the government can develop patterns about your personal life, about who your friends are, who your lovers are, things that the government has no right to know. Perhaps every once in a while they pick up a pattern that is important for national security, but at what risk to the rest of us and to our privacy? If we let the government in on everything, then we just simply have a police state. And there's no other way to say it. If the government knows more about the citizens than the citizens know about the government, we no longer have a democracy. It's got to be that the citizens know more about their government. It has to be that way. If the government can get a back door into our computers, our internet, our emails, our phone calls, our offices, they can manipulate that data, and they will, because it is always the powerful who control the surveillance. The drone program in the US is another example. We just saw this little video, and we saw the drone. And in 1974, when I worked for the uh, New Mexico Civil Liberties Union, long time ago, before many of you were even here or grown up, we had a privacy program where we talked about the government going into our homes, 1974. And now we have the government using drones, my government for sure, and killing people, killing people. People in the White House get together and say, we're going to kill this person today with a drone. The list of who they are going to kill is secret. The entire program was completely secret. Now at least we know it exists, but not much about it. These are people who've never been tried, never been convicted of anything, that someone in the government believes are that they are a danger to national security and a secret drone program secretly kills them. It's the excuse to justify, national security is the excuse to justify the killing and the excuse to justify the secrecy. So in my view, we cannot have a dem democratic society with this kind of secrecy. We just can't. What about lawyers? I'm a lawyer. I have to tell my clients that I've, I have an obligation, an ethical obligation, and this is true of all lawyers anywhere in the world, to protect their secrets. Clients can come to me and tell me anything, and unless they tell me they're about to commit a crime tomorrow, it's a secret. And I can't tell anyone, except I can't tell my clients that their secrets are safe with me if they tell me on the telephone, if they tell me over an email that just is supposed to go from them to me, if they tell me in an office where my phone is, my phone is in my purse over there, and somebody could be listening right through that turned off telephone, through any of your turned off telephones. The cameras that are on our computers, on, on our computers, unless you put tape over that camera, anybody from the government can get into that camera and see into your house. So 
I can't even tell my clients it's secret unless we turn off all our phones, hide them, or take a walk outside. And I've actually flown overseas to have meetings to avoid surveillance. So unless governments limit their secrets to what's truly necessary to protect national security, and unless, na and unless national security truly means that which is important to governments and not everything, then both of those fail. So we have a governments that generate fear, certainly mine does. And it learns little, if anything, when it paints with too broad a brush. That's the other problem. It paints with such a broad brush, it, in, it calls everything terrorism, it calls everything national security, and therefore it makes no distinctions. But it makes us all afraid. So it's not a great situation. Um, it is where we are today. And it's something that we have to be concerned about, all of us as citizens of the world. I give a version of this talk periodically, and I, I, um, I've been trying to figure out how to make it clear that this is not something new, that this is something we've had to worry about for a long time. And I found this, this quote that I'm going to uh, close with, and I can't find anything better. This was written by an American justice, a very, uh, very famous justice in the United States, Justice Douglas. And he wrote it when he was dissenting in a case in the United States Supreme Court in 1966, a long time ago. But I think what he said then, go back to maybe to Ibsen, an enemy of the people, and you realize that none of this is new. But what he said then really rings true today. So let me just um, read you this paragraph. The time may come when no one can be sure whether his words are being recorded for use at some future time, when everyone will fear that his most secret thoughts are no longer his own but belong to the government, when the most confidential and intimate conversations are always open to eager, prying ears. When that time comes, privacy and with it liberty will be gone. If a man's privacy can be invaded at will, who can say he is free? If his every word is taken down and evaluated, or if he is afraid every word may be, who can say he enjoys freedom of speech? If his every association is known and recorded, if the conversations with his associates are purloined, who can say he enjoys freedom of association? When such conditions exist, our citizens will be afraid to utter any but the safest, most orthodox thoughts, afraid to associate with any but the most acceptable people. Freedom, as we envision it, will have vanished. Ladies and gentlemen, it's up to us, the people in this room. We're the citizens of the world. We have to keep our democracy strong, open, transparent, and fair to all of us, citizens and non-citizens alike. Thank you.